Good afternoon and welcome to the third Institute of Health Studies Satellite Seminars in this series. Today in the studio we have uh, Heather Newton, uh, who is a nurse consultant at the Royal Ho Cornwall Hospital in Truro, with particular responsibility for tissue viability. She was appointed as clinical nurse specialist in 1995 and has also had responsibility for practice development over the last three years. Also in the studio today to discuss Heather's presentation, we have Anne Humphreys from the Institute of Health Studies. She is the academic lead for professional issues. And you've got me, I'm director of research for IHS. What we will do in this next hour is first Heather will give a presentation for about 20 minutes to half an hour on the role of the consultant nurse. At the end of her presentation, she will join us again here for discussion. That will be your chance to contact the studio with your comments and questions. There are three ways in which you can contact the studio and details of these will appear on your screen in a minute. And I'll tell you again after Heather's presentation. But if you have a pen and paper handy, you should note them now. You can phone in using your mobile or any other phone available on 01752 233 646. Alternatively, you can send a text message to 077 866 43257. Or lastly, you can email tvstudio at plymouth.ac.uk. As well as viewers down here in the southwest of England, we hope to have viewers from around Britain. In particular, we're expecting participation from Nottingham and Glasgow. It would be good for us to have some idea of how many centres and people are tuned in today. So maybe one person at your centre could contact the studio using one of these methods during Heather's presentation. We would like you to say, where you are and how many are viewing at your centre. So we now go over to Heather Newton. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I've been invited here today to talk to you about the role of the nurse, midwife and health visitor consultant. This presentation will provide an overview of the background of the nurse consultant role and how it is defined. Specific competencies required to achieve successful outcomes of the role will also be discussed. Many people are confused between the nurse consultant role and that of a specialist nurse, so I will make an attempt to distinguish between the two. I would also like to share with you the preliminary findings of the evaluation of the first wave of nurse consultants undertaken by King's College London. To explore the role at a local level, I will detail key areas within the tissue viability service at the Royal Cornwall Hospitals Trust, which are developing as a direct result of my nurse consultant post. And to conclude, I will summarise where I see the future of the role. All this in half an hour. What a tall order, but I'll give it a go. So how did these posts originate? Tony Blair dropped the idea of nurse consultants into his speech at the Nursing Standard Nurse of the Year Awards in 1998. During his speech, he outlined his five-point five plan for modernising the profession and stated that the role of the nurse consultant was to have the same status as medical consultants. The NHS plan target is for a thousand nurse consultants to be in post by 2004. Plans for these posts were first outlined in the Making a Difference document in July 1999 and in September the Health Service Circular 99217 was published to provide guidance for the establishment of nurse, midwife and health visitor consultant posts. The key aims of these posts were intended to provide better outcomes for patients by improving services and quality, to strengthen leadership and to provide a new career opportunity to help retain experienced and expert nurses, midwives and health visitors in practice. I'm sure some of the sceptics in the audience question the value of these higher level posts. In my own experience, since commencing the role, I have certainly been challenged as to the benefit to both patients and services, and I'm certainly expected to demonstrate outcomes of the post. I hope today, however, will clarify the value of the role and demonstrate how nurse consultants can really make a difference to patient care. The next two slides will give an overview of the specific influences that led to enhanced roles for nurses, midwives and health visitors. In the early 1990s, there were moves to reduce doctors' working hours 
and over the subsequent years, the UKCC and Department of Health introduced guidance for nurses to be able to undertake additional roles and responsibilities in the provision of patient care. The scope of professional practice and the Greenhill Report gave nurses the authority to expand their practice. Many nurses at the time, however, felt they were undertaking more and more roles that had previously been undertaken by doctors. However, the underpinning philosophy was that the expansion of nurses' roles was to enhance the holistic care for the patients and promote an improved quality of care provision. By 1996, doctors' hours were reduced and nurses were undertaking certain extended roles following completion of specific training. Towards the end of the 1990s, we were all aware that New Labour introduced plans to modernise the National Health Service. With this, this came reconfiguration of the workforce and less demarcation between professional roles. In 1998, as previously mentioned, nurse consultant roles were announced. Specific criteria were outlined in greater depth within the Making a Difference document the Making a Difference Nursing Strategy document and arrangements were detailed in the Health Service Circular. The Higher Level Practice Report, brought out in 1999 by the UKCC, provides standards for practice at a higher level and recommendations are that portfolio evidence of achievement is required for submission to register as a higher level practitioner. As you can see, the way has been prepared for the evolution of nurse, midwife and health visitor consultant posts. So what is the role of the nurse consultant? The role of the nurse consultant as defined by the NHS executive in 1999 describes five domains of practice. Expert practitioner, education and training and development role, a professional leadership role, practice and service development, and research and evaluation function. However, many specialist nurses or specialist practitioners may well argue that their roles also encompass these domains. The difference, however, lies in the level of skill, knowledge and experience of the healthcare professional and their capability to effectively perform within these domains at the highest possible level. With this in mind, I would like to explore the consultant role in greater depth. The practice expertise of nurse consultants is not necessarily linked to a medical speciality. Within the tissue viability services across the Royal Cornwall Hospital Trust site, for example, the service has been developed by nurses for many years. However, there are still strong working relationships with the vascular and dermatological services. The key to success is the ability to work across organisational boundaries and work across multi-professional and interdisciplinary boundaries as well. The nurse consultant is expected to spend 50% of their time in clinical practice. Advancing nursing practice, therefore, is key to the role, and the nurse consultant is required to demonstrate advanced clinical practice skills, as well as the ability to plan and drive service developments forward. In support of the government's initiatives and targets, together with local implementation plans, the nurse consultant can play a key role in achieving some of these outcomes. The practices of nurse consultants must demonstrate an improvement in service delivery and the competence of others. Nurse consultants are amongst some of the most senior nurses within organisations and therefore have a responsibility to develop and maintain, maintain standards of professional practice. Participating in shaping the future of healthcare provision requires nurse leaders who are strategic in their thinking and facilitative in their style. The nurse consultant role also encompasses research, education and consultancy, which is integral to the role. It's not an added extra. I am aware that some nurse consultants do not come from a clinical nurse back specialist background. However, the roles are often confused or assumed to be similar. The next two slides highlight the difference. As you can see, there is a regional approval of posts and also they need to be approved by the Department of Health before proceeding to advertise. The criteria for producing the proposal is well defined and a majority of job descriptions have been written using Department of Health guidelines. 
The health service circular identifies that nurse consultants must be senior, experienced practitioners who are experts in their field. However, when I've been looking at the various job descriptions, the experience within the field of practice actually varies within the job, the job criteria from two to six years. Unlike many, many clinical specialist posts, the educational requirements for this post are clearly detailed and require the post holder to have to obtained a master's qualification or at least working towards it. This will equip the nurse consultant with the critical thinking skills required to work at this higher level of practice. The nurse consultant has protected time for research, education and personal development. Unlike specialist nurses, who find themselves working for the majority of their time in clinical practice. A publication and research portfolio acknowledges the academic ability which is essential for developing the service, the role and the links with higher educational establishments. An essential part of the role is strong professional leadership with the need to work across boundaries, manage change and influence quality patient care. Alongside this, the nurse consultant is also required to influence local health policy. Personally, I feel that a major difference in the role is the expectations. Now that I've been in post, the expectations appear quite high. These posts are new. They are not intended to replace medical staff, but to extend the boundaries of current nursing practice. At last, however, the evolution of nursing roles has been recognised. Competencies, competency is becoming a common word now in professional development terms and in its simplest sense can be described as the capability or necessary qualities of an individual to carry out a particular role or function and its use denotes the level of skill attained or required. Within Cornwall, the nurse consultants have established a peer learning forum and developing core and specific competencies for nurse consultants is part of the work of this group. The following slides provide an overview of the types of competencies required to fulfil the role. However, within the time constraints, going into specific detail of measuring achievement is not possible. Ability to make critical judgments, undertake advanced clinical interventions, take a vi visionary approach to care and service delivery and take responsibility for total episodes of patient care or demonstrate expertise in practice. Benner's work, way back in the 1980s, stimulated a lot of thought into what an expert practitioner was and generated a lot more research into this topic. It appears from more recent evidence that expert problem solving, making critical judgments, advancing practice and achieving change are also attributes of an expert practitioner. The educational competence of the nurse consultant lies in their ability to map and plan education to meet needs at a strategic level. There is also a need to critically appraise and reflect on the outcomes to demonstrate the impact upon clinical practice. Delivering this education agenda is also a key component of the role. It has been acknowledged that nurse consultants will work closely with academic institutions, particularly within curriculum development and maintaining the link between theory and practice. The ability to introduce strategies for developing and promotion, promoting patient education and information to meet the government's agenda are also important and using expert patients is a novel approach which I would personally like to pursue. The need for strong professional leadership in nursing was clearly highlighted in the Making a Difference document and the nurse consultant leadership competencies can be defined as follows. Developing clinical practice, inspiring and sustaining change, promoting interdisciplinary and multi-agency collaboration, strategic decision-making and anticipating and planning future needs. There is a strong practice and service development role for the nurse consultant and as highlighted on this slide there is a need for a visionary approach to the delivery of service and the development of other healthcare professionals. 
particularly in the exploring the new ways of working. The ability to effectively promote and use research in practice has a strong emphasis within the role, as does initiating, leading and conducting research to increase the body of knowledge. The nurse consultant, therefore, is required to have these skills and competencies to, to be able to deliver this research part of the role. What I would like to do now is briefly look at the preliminary evaluation of the establishment of nurse, midwife and health visitor consultants undertaken by King's College London. This will be a snapshot because the complete document is vast, but these are just salient points and key areas that I've picked out. The survey was conducted in 2001 and a semi-structured self-completion questionnaire was used. The aim was to provide a systematic audit of roles, contexts and experiences. It was sent to 162 consultants that were in post by February 2002 and it was amazing that they obtained a 95% response rate. As you can see, there are a wide variety of work speciality posts, with a larger percentage of posts being hospital-based. The academic level reflects the expectations of the post, and only a small percentage did not have a first degree. It is encouraging to see that 51% of posts were filled internally. In other words, these nurses were homegrown. I was surprised, however, that not all nurse consultants had a detailed job description in view of the fact that this was, had to be produced to, to obtain acceptance of the post. The level of pay and support mechanisms available were quite variable, and this may be linked with the way that posts have been developed and introduced across the organisations. 65% of nurse consultants reported that they were either taking the lead or making a major contribution to the involvement of the activities detailed in the health service circular. The highest was within the leadership function and closely followed by the research and development role. This slide demonstrates how, the, how positive the role appears to be developing. The proposed 50% time spent in clinical practice appears to be, be almost being achieved and the amount of research and development activity is increasing. A substantial number of consultants felt that their role profile had changed and that they had positive opportunities for personal growth and professional development. What I would like to do now is actually bring the presentation down to a local level and share with you some of the objectives of the Tissue Viability Service with, across the Royal Cornwall Hospital Trust. The Tissue Viability Service was set up in 1995. I've been very determined since obtaining the nurse consultant role that it was just not um, an add-on to the um, nurse specialist role that I was previously in. Many of the skills I felt were transferable, but it was the work practices that I really felt consciously that I had to try and perform diff differently. Raising the profile of the role was initially undertaken through meeting key personnel across the organisation. However, now my expertise and ability to work at this higher level is demonstrated through visual role modelling, expert consultancy and actually demonstrating effective patient outcomes. The role cannot function in isolation and I have a clinical practice educator working closely with me. There are also strong links with the community tissue viability team which include cross-boundary policy development, education delivery and discharge planning and support. Linking with the reforming emergency care project, there will be exciting developments ahead to support early interventions, outreach services and appropriate discharge of patients with tissue viability needs. In order to plan and prioritise delivery of the service, the referral process is undergoing a review. The current level of referrals is unsustainable, so the plan is to deliver education in practice to high referral areas to give the nurses the confidence to manage these patients with low to moderate tissue viability needs. 
Pathways of care for patients with acute and chronic wounds will inevitably enhance the quality of patient care in relation to appropriately, appropriate and timely referral and management. I'm at present investigating research opportunities for patients with leg ulcers, whilst my colleague is looking at research within lymphedema patients. Links have always been strong with the University of Plymouth, however, further partnership working will be explored in the future. Another part of the role is actually developing the nurse-led clinics. This is a new role for myself and I feel there is an awful lot of development within this area, but this is um, certainly one key area that I feel is going to be a really important part of the nurse consultant role. And to conclude, the introduction of nurse consultant posts into the National Health Service is a major ambitious development within nursing and organisations and they need to be supportive of the role and help to build foundations for future new nursing roles. The organisation has a responsibility to support, own and steer this important nursing development and research by Kim Manley in 2000 suggests that this is very important if competence is to be maintained. I feel that there is still an area, however, surrounding validation of the role and requirements needed to register as a higher level practitioner that really do need further clarification. I personally feel that the nursing profession has moved a long way since the mid-1990s and that the boundaries between medical and nursing practice are shifting. Working and learning together within the clinical and educational environment is key to achieving successful patient outcomes. Medical and nursing roles can complement each other, particularly in the ma management of patients with chronic conditions. Links with higher education establishments can also support and promote this approach. Whilst I feel that many nurse consultants already have key competencies to fulfil the role, as it develops there will be further skills and competencies identified which reflect the importance of lifelong learning. The nurse consultant has a huge repertoire of core and specialist skills which can be utilised autonomously. However, when combined with medical practitioners in the management of specific clinical cases, this can only seek to ensure that the patient receives the highest possible standards of care. With the current climate of change within the NHS, nurse consultants' future lies in their ability to lead services and transform practice, which is sustained yet creative and flexible. It will be through, ro through robust evaluation of these demanding yet exciting roles that the true impact will be realised. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, and while Heather comes to join us again here uh, for the discussion, I'd just like to take this opportunity to remind you that you can contact the studio now um, by telephoning 01752 Two double three six four six, or you can text O double seven eight double six four three two five seven, or lastly you can email us on tvstudio at plymouth.ac.uk, and we have in fact already had a uh, an email from Faye Doris uh, in Plymouth, so maybe we'll start with that, Heather. Uh, Faye says, Heather, how far do you think? nurse, midwife or health visitor consultants have come in achieving equitable status to that of medical consultants and secondly, staying with status, have you found that the same structures exist within your trust to influence policy as medical consultants? So uh, that's the question from Faye. Faye, Faye is, uh, is head of uh, midwifery and uh, other things in, in Plymouth. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I think these con consultant posts are so new and I really don't believe that um, there is a, a wide understanding of their, the, the, the roles. Um, it, my own personal experience is I've had to work really hard and certainly um, be out and about meeting people, make, be really proactive in um, sharing the role. I produced an information sheet when I met the directors and heads of departments as part of my induction to actually share the role and I've had opportunities as well to um, go to directorate meetings. So um, I'm not sure that really people understand the role clearly um, or some people don't always want to understand it, they just think it's a new role and it will gradually evolve. Um, the second part of the question was, was about um, the 
or was, have you found that the same structures exist within your trust to influence policy as medical consultants, the same structures as medical consultants? Having worked in practice development department for many years, there are very clear um, structures in place within the organisation and myself I've, I've not had too many difficulties because I've been part of multi-professional groups where we've been um, certainly striving to achieve um, consistency across medical and nursing profession so I think personally I don't feel that there have been I think in some areas there may well be um, quite diff a lot of differences. Okay, and um, pass it to you. Well, I'd like to um, carry on with that multi-professional theme, actually. It was a, a useful question to come in. One of the aspects is about developing multi-professional working, and clearly that is, is quite a watchword at the moment in education. Could you expand a bit on how you have developed this particular area, given that you're a uh, your hospital-based your hospital yes. um, service in tissue viability? I think my multi-professional working has mostly been, as you said, with, with hospital um, medical staff, therapy staff, um, physios and OTs, pharmacy staff very much as well, and dietetic services, because within tissue viability there is, um, it encompasses all of the, those um, different uh, disciplines of healthcare professionals. The, I think the key important part is that you don't, as a specialist nurse, I have a, a huge amount of knowledge about tissue viability and I think one of the key things is to respect that other healthcare professionals have knowledge and that, that we can equally share our knowledge um, for the, the end patient outcome. So it's really um, working, the, the importance is being referred to in the first place and that may well initially by, nurse, by nursing staff but I um, make a conscious effort to involve the medical team um, as well, and we work together, um, certainly in the clinical area, on achieving a, an effective management plan. Within education, um, I've been very involved in linking with junior doctors, post-reg um, and uh, pre-reg medical, medical students, and um, becoming involved in the, their education as well. And that's been very important to raise the profile from an early stage that nurses and doctors can work together. Mm. Uh, we've got a, um, a telephone call now from uh, Louise Vickery from Taunton. Uh, can you just remind you, Louise, to please to uh, mute the sound on the TV before, uh, before phoning in? So, Louise, take it away. Hello, Heather. Um, I have, have a question uh, regarding your nursing consultant role. It's Louise Vickery, both from Taunton. Uh, I, I just wondered how you're managing to detach yourself from your previous clinical nurse specialist Hello Louise, thank you very much for your question. Um, it's been very, very difficult. For the first few months I actually didn't have the bleep and that was um, a very important part of um, my induction not to have the bleep. Um, I'm very lucky that I have Julie working with me so therefore um, she was able to take some of the clinical role as well. So that was the initial introduction. I think the the key point is is the way I work. I um, I seem to um, I see a patient now and I work through that complete I try and work through that complete episode of patient care. I felt as a specialist nurse I was often running around like a headless chicken and not actually necessarily following through that complete episode of care. I would dip in and dip out. Now I, I um, the consultants are offering me the opportunity, I suppose, um, to actually complete that episode of care, which is very different. It is very hard. I think sometimes I do slip back into being a specialist nurse, and I have to remember that um, I have to um, map out my research and education time as well. Initially, I made a, a, a job plan based on a medical model and looked at opportunities to separate the research and education time and my clinical time, and that does seem to be working quite well. Mm. It's, it's an interesting sort of developing role, as, as you've described, and clearly the profession thought long and hard about um, this sort of criteria. I'm interested in um, taking you to the King's Fund research and mm -hmm. some of those results, in particular the the apparent breadth in some of the educational um, um, qualifications that um, most consultants had. Have you got a view on how this affects the, the developing role, given that your background is clearly that you've got, you've got a higher degree yourself? 
Well, actually, I've almost completed my, my higher degree. Mm -hmm. I'm actually one of the 10% who don't have a first level degree. However, I did do a bridging, the module I did at, um, to commence my BSc was my degree, um, my research module. So I felt that was the key, one of the key modules that would help me to progress, certainly to a master's level qualification. Um, I feel that what is really important is that having the skills and competencies and the ability to translate those into the role and practice is really important. The research aspect and the educational part of the roles are key to success of the, this post and that makes them quite different to the specialist nursing role. Therefore those are the key elements um, within preparation for these nurse consultant roles that are very important and I think anybody should be looking to the specifically to developing skills and competencies in those areas. Mm. The other, the other um, Kings Fund resu um, research result that was was an interesting one was that there was only fifty three percent of nurse consultants were hospital based. That um, may surprise some some mm. people. Um, what was your view on that? I thought um, that was that was quite a surprising result that 53 percent were hospital based with a, um, the drive towards a primary care led, led national mm. health service now I really felt that there would be more nurse consultant post within primary care however it may be that primary care organizations are still very new and that um, they maybe not ha do not have um, such a robust infrastructure at the moment to be able to support these new posts. Um, some um, primary care organisations were, um, and the way that the trusts were set up still didn't have a nurse lead at some point. So maybe these, um, there will be more. I, I anticipate that there would be more primary care mm -hmm. nurse consultants or nurse midwifery and health visitor consultants. Given. You can come, so I can. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All those questions. Um, Given that we've, we've got the roles that are very new, how do you see whether these roles are going to be validated? Because you did briefly mention that at the end of your presentation. I think with the higher level of practice report, the, the standards that are set out there, I think that that may well be a key um, area where, where validation. I do have concerns about validation of, of the role. I think um, as specialist nurses for many years roles have evolved and there hasn't been a real robust mm. structure. There has been wide variations and disparity again, uh, amongst the roles and I would be concerned that nurse consultant posts would be leading that way without a, a very clear validation process. The medical fraternity, they have very um, robust validation processes and I think that um, these higher level posts should be subject to a robust validation. But I think the higher level of practice and the registration, being able to re-register, should demonstrate. You should be able to demonstrate achievement of the standards yeah. at the highest level. Okay. There's a, there's a question coming from Bodmin, um, asking about uh, the 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 need for education. You, you talked about the um, the links with the academic institutions, mm -hmm. and, and you also talked about sort of the role in research. Um, th the question is about what are the educational needs of the nurse consultants themselves? Are there, are there courses, are there, is there research training, for example, that um, nurse consultants might need and that um, the academic institutions could provide? Right. Um, having undertaken the Masters in Healthcare, um, which is, had a very strong research focus, so personally I did four research modules, uh, including evidence-based practice module. Um, so, and also, personally, I've um, undergone the postgraduate certificate in education as well, which was a very um, supportive um, um, per, uh, I think of the words now. Um, it was a very good uh, course to have undertaken to prepare you for an educational role. Um, the the research, um, I think the the academic institutions could help um, prepare people more for for the research because I think it's about applying the research. Um, in practice and also about um, looking at the methodologies and, and helping people to map out their own research. So I think yes, but the Masters certainly does prepare you for that, um, but the academic institutions would certainly mm. be there to support. Do you think, I mean, for example, I know that um, at Plymouth University there's been talk about the need for a professional doctorate, that is a, uh, a PhD which is slightly more structured than the sort of rather more academic mm. one. Do you think that would be the sort of thing that would be appropriate for many nurse consultants? I, mean. I think it may well be. I mean, at, at the moment, personally, I feel I'm just struggling through the MSc and to, to consider any more 
um, education at the moment for me, but I think certainly it, it's there, there needs to be a progression, and PhD would certainly be. Many of my colleagues are actually signed up to do um, PhD study, right. so I think certainly that would be very valuable mm. in, within, within nursing. Yes. Um, staying on the, the research side, I was really interested in that part of the criteria is protected time for research. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's about what you've mentioned briefly that you're talking about application of research or you're, at, you're doing primary research yes. yourself. Which sort of camp are you sitting in currently, given that things are developing? I think as, as a nurse and so, uh, nurses um, in practice and as a specialist nurse then we, we, we were we're much more aware of using the evidence base in our mm. practice now. So what I'm now focusing more on I suppose is, is the actual undertaking the research myself. However, um, within the educational role, using the, the research as an, and the evidence as a base and a foundation for educating staff. Is, is a really important. So I think probably both camps really, um, but personally, um, undertaking research is a new area for me. So that's a new challenge. Mm. I think I'm uh, asking the question that probably everybody does: How do you manage the protected time? Uh, As I said um, to Louise's question, I did have to map out a, a job profile and. I have to be very strict. I'm not always very strict. Hence, my working hours are, uh, my working days are, are a little bit longer at times. But um, it's about planning and making sure. I alluded to the fact that the referral process was under review. The referrals at the moment come in very ad hoc to the service, and what we want to do is make that a more robust process, and that there is a method of uh, identifying priorities for patient referrals, because at the moment we don't have that. If we can try and prioritise the way we're working, we, would, we think we can provide a more efficient way of working. Patients don't get any less of a service from us, but what we can do is release some, some of the time that it, to be protected for, for me for, for research and education. But I certainly try to follow the job plan wherever I can. Right. Okay. That leads, obviously, to sharing your ideas, because... Um, Clearly, research, even local research, needs to be developed. How, how is it sort of nationally and locally? Do you disseminate the, the activities of this particular role? Um, I, I belong to a, a um, national tissue viability nurse consultant forum. There are um, five of us that meet regularly. And that's, at the moment, as a supervisory process because we feel that we need needed support for each other um, in our new evolving roles. Um, I actually participate um, as a national speaker, um, so I present nationally and internationally, and I publish, I have a wide publication, and I'm con get, that will be con certainly continued, um, and writing book chapters and reviews. I've been um, an assistant editor for the Nursing Standard for many years for the Wound Care Supplement, and um, actually um, encouraging people to write and write their findings. Yes. Um, and that's quite difficult at times. I've uh, since given up that role, but now I do review for them as well. And, um, and it's, it's really good to see how much is, is coming forward. But it's important that we encourage people to disseminate mm. um, that way. So I personally do that, but also try to encourage others. Okay. I've got um, uh, an email coming again from Plymouth. This is from uh, Marcelo Lopez, who's uh, um, a senior clinical medical officer who's and uh, visiting Plymouth and she asks how would you define the role of a consultant nurse in the primary care trusts do they have a public health role some nurse consultants actually are employed as um, within public health I, I believe I don't know too much about um, the, the specific um, I mean, this is, is it about a specific public health role or is it as integral with health promotion and public health I think that might be what I suppose she's asking just what I mean, yes. about in certain I mean, the, in, in, there are uh, so many, as you see, there were 60 in the evaluation, there were 60 mm. different, different types of nurse yeah. consultant roles. I think health promotion really is integral to probably the majority of nurse consultant roles. Um, and I don't know that you could actually, um, certainly in my tissue viability role, health promotion is really important with patients with leg ulcers and wounds. And I think you could argue that in the mental health arena and in any other clinical um, or medical situation that health promotion should be integral. 
it's not a specific facet or domain of the nurse consultant role, which is actually quite interesting. Mm. Um, maybe it's just an assumed one. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the other outcomes that you've got to meet is improved service delivery. That's a, mm. such a broad umbrella. Yes. But given that we have very recently um, got the you know, government's view on, on freeing up the restrictions on, on hospitals, have you had any time to think about where you as a nurse consultant would fit in with um, any roles that would, would develop yes. in those sort of um, organisations? I think obviously in my role it's still quite early days and um, but obviously lots of things go through my head as I'm mapping and planning the role. One of my key, I think the key outcomes that I need to achieve within this sort of new ways of working is actually looking at how I can impact on A, preventing patients with tissue fibrosis disease coming into hospital in the first place and that's working very closely with the community tissue fibrosis team so that we have a, a unified approach to the management of patients and looking at maybe the early, early interventions and the support that the district nurses and practice nurses and the GPs need. So again, that may well um, come to fruition through mapping out the pathway mm -hmm. um, because that will obviously start within the primary care setting. Um, the, the other way really is to look at the discharges and look at whether the, interve the earlier interventions and the earlier referrals from the nurse consultant can actually impact. impact um, I've got another um, telephone call now, so if we can go to the telephone call from, I think, I think this is um, from Plymouth again. Ask the question, please. Yeah. Um, this is about the question I made about the role of the mm, consultant nurse. I, I wanted to, um, to, uh, to find out if the role of these nurses are, could be similar to the role of the um, public health practitioner, consultant practitioner that um, Scotland has developed recently, or if that's not the case, what could be the role of this consultant nurse at the primary care level? Thanks. Okay, if, you, if um, I'll just give them a chance to uh, turn, turn their, their sound back up again on their on their TV and to sort of repeat the question in case you didn't hear it. Um, it the question was, um, how similar is the role going to be of the nurse consultant in public health? And it, it's maybe difficult if you don't, if you're not mm. too sure about the, the public health role of the nurses. And I'm not sure if we have, have any mm. consultant nurse consultants in public health watching. Um, but how might, how similar will that be to the the role which is being developed in Scotland in um, in the specialist um, nursing nurses in public health which, which they have in Scotland? But maybe maybe you can't no, answer. No, um, I don't really know anything about um, that specific role. I mean, the, if you look at the higher level of practice document, um, then there are very clear standards to achieve for higher level practice or practitioners. So I would assume that the, the roles would, it would need to encompass that higher level of practice competencies and standards anyway, but how the actual role differs, I, I couldn't answer the question. Okay, so if there's any, um, if there are any consultants, uh, nurses in public health out there, please phone in now and perhaps you can help answer that question. I'll take another email here, I've got an email from Chris Hanks, uh, who is um, Principal Lecturer in Gerontology at Institute of Health Studies. She asks, do you get the opportunity to liaise with other nurse consultants or do you think this would be useful? I certainly have an opportunity to liaise with other nurse consultants. Um, certainly within Cornwall we set up our own peer learning forum and um, all of the nurse consultants in Cornwall meet. Um, we meet um, quite regularly every six weeks and uh, there is a regional nurse consultant group which I haven't yet attended but I hope to attend in January. And then, as I said before, I, I'm part of a national tissue viability nurse consultant group as well. Um, I think it's really important to network with other nurse consultants. Um, actually, it's not just the nurse consultants, it's mid midwifery consultants as well in, in the Cornwall Forum. It was the nurse consultants in, in London that I meet with, or 
the, the tissue viability nurse consultants. But I think um, it's amazing what you learn about how the roles were set up and the diversity of the roles. And also, for me as a fairly new nurse consultant, I feel I've been able to learn a lot from my colleagues who've been in post for about 18 months. Um, to you know, sort of 18 months to two years and I, I feel that's been really valuable because you learn from their mistakes and, and their the difficulties in setting up the role. Oh and uh, we have a, a call from Glasgow so uh, hello Glasgow. Uh, I'd like to go ahead with your call please turning down the, uh, the, the mute on the sound. Go ahead. Um, hi. Hi, it's Anne Gow here. I'm nurse consultant in public health in Glasgow mm. Primary Care Trust. Um, just to clarify, the, I think the question earlier about public health practitioners and public health nurse consultants. Um, there is a, a, a difference in the role. Public health practitioners don't necessarily have to be nurses, and indeed many of ours aren't. And we work at a um, very local level. Certainly if you look at the competencies, the spread of competence is probably fairly similar to the public health nurse consultant role, mm -hmm. um, but how they carry out those competencies is, is, is um, quite different. There's probably got a lot more community involvement and so on because they work for our LHCCs. As public health nurse consultant, I provide um, professional support for the public health nurses, and we've just lost a visual link there, fine. Um, and um, work at probably a far higher level at board um, influencing planning and so on. Um, and my roles are directed at nurses and developing nursing as a profession linked with public health rather than being purely public health and linked with um, health improvement. So it's a, a mixture of both. Um, if that answers the question of the, the person who phoned in a few minutes ago. Well, I hope so. Thank, and thanks very much indeed for, for phoning in. Um, I'm glad to know that there's somebody up there in Glasgow um, and, and in the studio. <laughs> yes, and uh, yes. Over to me. Be looking for the future now. Um, your final slide gave the opening flower of um, the nurse consultant. And one aspect you said you're going to be aiming for is organisational recognition. And um, clearly, people are, are becoming fami more familiar with the role. So, what are you planning to do? What are your plans to meet that aim? I think, really, with the organisational recognition, was the fact that if um, we were looking at the future and looking at exploring boundaries, looking at um, the leadership development and competency development, and actually promoting multi-professional working and learning, then it was really important that the organisation recognised this and so that was really the key to that that particular part of the slide um, nurse consultant posts are new um, they were introduced quite um, uh, Tony Blair just announced them really without a, um, a lot of um, discussion around them initially and then I think as I said before it's it's about understanding really how um, this role can actually improve patient care and service delivery but the and I mean, I was lucky I met all the exec board um, when I first came into post and had opportunities to ask them questions about how they thought, what they felt about the role really, what they understood about the role, because it was my opportunity that I had to talk to them, not just about saying what I thought the role was about. So it was a two-way process. I don't know whether other, other nurse consultants had that luxury or whether they were just thrown into the post. I certainly was very lucky, but I felt it was a very important part that the organisation recognised um, that um, the role of the nurse consultant and the difference that we can make to patient care. Okay, okay we have uh, another call coming in, so uh, I don't know if we're ready to take that call yet. Just, uh, it's, it's just, uh, just coming. It's from Taunton. Somebody from Taunton? Go ahead, please. Well, I'm not sure if... Uh, oh, here Hello, Heather. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, which is very stimulating and interesting. Call some discussion in the room here. Um, what I'd like to have with you, from you on is the sort of tips that you would give us into um, successfully supporting nurse consultant roles being implemented within the trust and overcoming some of the barriers that we hear happen, such as issues between nursing colleagues and doctors. Thank you. Um, didn't, uh, didn't actually say who it was, but I, I think it may have been uh, Peter Fenn, I'm not sure, but uh, anyway, you'd like to carry on with that. Okay, we, uh, is, is, 
I think the first part of your question was about really sort of setting up the, the role or initiating the role. Um, and in, if that was the case, then it, it's very important to identify the need. And as I said, it's not necessarily linked with the medical speciality. It's actually mm -hmm. looking at the impact of the, this type of role on um, the organization. And I think that is key. It's not about working in isolation. It's actually working to achieve some of the objectives for the organization. Well, within um, tissue viability services, the um, chronic wound management is costly to the health service and uh, quite labor intensive. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's been well recognized in the literature. And actually with the level of, the, the, it can be demonstrated that level of knowledge across healthcare professionals can actually impact on patient outcomes within this, this service. So I think that's key in the development of roles to actually acknowledge this. But also when, when you're writing these proposals is to actually um, work through them with colleagues um, so that there is an owned or it's, it's an approach that's owned by the organisation. It's not just done as, a, as an, an isolated um, action. It, it's actually that you encompass um, key people in the development of the role. Mm -hmm. The... Um role is, is established now, if, but if you had an opportunity at the beginning, this is a hindsight question I think, <laughs> with the golden hindsight, what, what would you have um, hoped to be put into place in order to have facilitated this, the development of the role more effectively? Um, I actually feel I've been very, very well supported um, within my organisation. Um, as I said before, I had opportunities. I didn't have to one day be the nurse specialist and one day be the nurse consultant. I had a transitional introduction. And um, I've been given um, a remit to really map out um, and plan how the service is going to be developed. I don't think, I mean, I think there will be outcomes of the role or the development of the role. And that, um, in some part, is my own personal development as well. One of the new things that I didn't actually um, allude to in the presentation was the setting up of the nurse-led clinics. And I think it's really, this is very new, um, certainly for myself in tissue viability. Within primary care, nurses are, are quite used to running their own clinics, whereas for me it's very different. And it's looking at that total episode of patient care. It's looking at being able to discharge, being able to request um, diagnostic interventions, being able to do the interventions as well. And this is where my personal development plan also links with the role development and the service developments, because undertaking a pilot of the clinic um, with supervised practice has been really very valuable. And that now has given me an opportunity to identify really what I don't know or what I need to know to be able to complete that episode of care, and that becomes part of my personal development plan. Mm. That's interesting because that's the issue about competency required for the role and that's been the challenge always for us as nurses to do with yes. nurse-led nurse clinics in, in particular. Obviously from, from an education point of view it's involving um, students and, and pre-registration students in areas in, in particular. Where do you see that perhaps they can fit in in that interface in perhaps in a nurse-led clinic, you know, planning yes. for that, that, that aspect? Well, at the moment, we actually have students regularly out on their practice placements with the tissue viability team. They, it's a, a topic area that they are very keen, and I'm also very keen to um, continue that, those practices. That's, um, at the moment, obviously, they're just coming around with us within the trust, so it gives them a very broad overview of the trust and the type of wounds and patients that we would see. Within the clinic arena, it's an ideal opportunity for educa education training uh, opportunities, really. And... Uh, and learning the, the sort of skills are, of assessment and consultation, really, with patients. So very, very, uh, something that really needs to be continued. Yeah, so we've certainly, uh, we're trying to open up the opportunities mm. for students to see particularly clinics that give an opportunity to go into, perhaps into the community yes. areas as well. I think another area is a, like a sort of minor injuries area where yeah. that's very much nursing-led now. And I think students can gain an awful lot of... Um, knowledge and skill from from those nurses as well yeah. can i just uh, ask sort of really um worth winding up here now starting to wind up anyway um if you're going to evaluate this this sort of role i mean uh, 
I know the, the King's, the King's mm -hmm. College have already done some sort of evaluation, but if you're going to carry on evaluating it and look, look, say, in, I don't know, three, four years' yeah. time, was this a success? Was it, was it worthwhile? What sort of outcomes would you look at? What sort of, you know, what, what can we look at? What can we measure? How can we judge success? Uh, overall, not just not just yeah. you, but I mean. Uh, no. yeah. I mean, I think it's important that you say actually that it's you know, three to five years because I think that's an honest time span to evaluate this sort of role because it can take sometimes six months to a year to just set up the way the different ways of working. So, um, the key outcomes I think will be certain. That, I mean, they can be qualitative and quantitative because it could be about whether the the um, increased clinics has led to reducing outpatient waiting times and those sort of quantitative type figures. Qualitative has been quite difficult. I've been actually keep, keep, keeping a reflective um, diary because some of the things uh, that happen, like a new uh, a consultant you've never worked with before asks you to see a patient, you wonder what's triggered that. That's quite, mm. it's not very tangible in measurement terms, but it's actually an out, I feel that's a real, uh, that's an outcome for me that somebody has asked me to see a patient that wouldn't have not, maybe not done over the years. Um, the key outcomes as well will be within the domains, I think, as well, of, of the, the practice, and whether within those domains that it's made a difference to um, the patient throughput um, and patient care, really, and whether um, the earlier interventions made a difference. But that's mm -hmm. quite hard sometimes to put that evaluation into, mm -hmm. into place. So if, if there are no more uh, questions, I think we're, we're, we're coming up to the, uh, the finish. So um, I think we'd like to thank um, Heather Newton for her, for her time here today. Um, thank you very much, Heather. We'd like to thank and Humphreys and I'd like to thank all of you um, out there for your questions and um, to remind you of the of the coming seminars. Um, in December we have uh, a seminar on in, in the 5th of December which is a NICE seminar looking at uh, guidance on pressure ulcer risk assessment and prevention. Then on December the 12th we have Bob Gann who's director of NHS Direct Online and he'll be talking about NHS Direct Online. As always, these seminars are open to all of you, so do please put the, uh, the dates in your diary, tell your colleagues and friends, and uh, we look forward to your participation. Goodbye. <laughs>